Well, good morning. Um, I think I mentioned in the last lecture that I will have an extra office hour in the evening today. So the regular office hour works in my office between 1 and 3 o'clock. I'll be there if you want to come. Uh, but if you're not able to make it, then between 7 and 9, I'll be available online. Okay. And um, as long as there are people in the room, I'll be there. But if nobody is there, and then I will sign out. Okay. So if you want to have any help during the session, try to be there around 7 o'clock. And then we can spend the whole two hours if you need. Okay. And people can then uh, come and join. Uh, any questions for me before I start? This is the theoretical part of the course. Uh, so we will deal with interspersed examples from chemical engineering uh, drawn basically from chapter one still. Uh, but I'm going to illustrate how these algorithms are developed, how does uh, MATLAB various algorithms work, and how does Aspen work. So sometime in the course I'm going to introduce uh, how to set up Aspen type of problems to solve similar examples. And what I brought today is, uh, I think, your previous assignment. I, I was traveling. I just got back uh, to Baton Rouge last night. So I haven't really had a chance to look at your exam. Okay, uh, I left right after the lecture on Thursday. So I'm going to try to mark it between today and tomorrow and try to get it back by Thursday. I'll do my best. No promises. Um, and. Uh, the next assignment, I guess I will make it maybe over the weekend. This current one is due on Thursday, I guess we said, right? Thursday at 4 o'clock. Okay. Are there any questions on anything that we've seen so far? How is the assignment going? It's pretty challenging. Pretty challenging, long or? <laughs> but it's a good summary of everything that we have seen because there is an example on how to use uh, F0 or FSOL and uh, if you see the exam question one of them was kind of a variation on that. that. If you can do that you should have no difficulty in passing this course. Same examples but I ask you to solve using F0, post it as one equation in one unknown or post it as three equations and three unknowns. Variations like this you should be able to handle. And uh, the set of examples will continue to build. Last lecture, we started talking about Flash, and we'll continue to use that to illustrate various algorithms. But there will be part of the exam, particularly in the same midterm and the final, where I will ask you questions about algorithms. Okay, what is the difference between bisection and regular file size scheme or a sequence scheme, etc. So that's what we are going to do today. Continue to do that. Okay. So I am available for office hours. If you're doing the current assignment, please feel free to come and see me. But as always, I'm, when I'm in my office, you can uh, feel free to drop any time. So in the last lecture, we looked at the idea behind how do these algorithms develop. Algorithm is a systematic procedure to achieve a certain goal. And the goal that we want to achieve in these problems is to be able to solve a given single nonlinear algebraic equation. Sometimes you might have two or three equations, but it would be possible to eliminate some of these variables. Not physically eliminate on a piece of paper to reduce it to a single equation, but in your computation. Okay, you can, for example, in your current assignment, the, one of the questions is, is there a value of QT flow rate that will make V1 and V2 the same? Okay, that is a very practical engineering type of question that you might ask. Then you make QT as your unknown and calculate V1 and V2 based on that QT and have one equation that you want to test to see whether that condition is satisfied or not. So reformulating like that is where I can check your creativity. Okay, And so that will be part of the exam. So in the bisection method, we saw the algorithm as a very naive concept. That is, you make two guesses, x1 and x2, and they calculate the corresponding function values. And you make sure when you do that, they are on the opposite side of a root. So the functions must be, product of the functions must be negative. One function must be positive, the other one must be negative. That means the function goes through zero as long as the function is continuous. And then in the uh, bisection method, we said x3, a strategy for making an improved guess. So the initial guesses are arbitrary, x1 and x2 are arbitrary. And you make an improved guess, which is simply x3 is equal to uh, x1 plus x2 over 2. Now we are going to see a second and a series of three or four other methods that build on this idea and keep improving. 
the convergence. Convergence means how fast does it reach the solution? How many times do I have to guess? That it, so if I can guess fewer times, that means it converges faster. Okay? So that is what is called convergence rate. And we want a high convergence rate. We want to develop an algorithm that does that. So in the regular false method, the main idea is if you give me two guesses for the function x1 and x2, and I have f1 and f2, instead of simply taking the midpoint between x1 and x2, I'm going to draw a line that connects f1 and f2. That's a straight line. Okay? And then I'm going to ask the question, where does that straight line intersect the x-axis? That is going to be my better guess. So my strategy for finding new value of guess is x3 is going to lie on that straight line that I have indicated here. Conceptually, geometrically, that is what I'm, I'm trying to do. So mathematically, how do I change my algorithm that will implement this one? Okay, And that algorithm is given by this. How many of you think having given the idea, you can show that, you can derive that equation? What is involved in deriving that equation? The equation simply says x3 equals x1 minus f1 times x2 minus x1 over f2 minus f1. How did I get that? That's what the question is. Formula for slope. That is exactly the idea. Right? <laughs> so you take this formula for the slope and you, you can calculate the slope in a number of different ways. For example, I can take this part and take that slope and then I can take this part and take that slope and say these two slopes must be the same because I'm saying that it is on this straight line. Okay? Or you can do any one of them. You can take uh, this triangle and you can take this whole triangle. Okay, So if you use for example uh, x2 minus x1 divided by f2 minus f1, we are just using similarity triangle. I'm not even calculating the slope. If I interpreted this as a slope, then I must actually write it as f2 minus f1 divided by x2 minus x1 because it is rise over run. Right? But I'm just using similarity triangle, which is the inverted version of that equation. It says x2 minus x1 divided by f2 minus x1 is equal to uh, x3 uh, minus x1 divided by f3 minus f1. Those are equal. Okay, those two triangles are similar, so these ratios are equal. And then I rearrange that equation into this form. What do I need to do? I need to separate x3. So I'm going to treat in this equation x3 as the unknown I'm solving for because I want to know where does that straight line intersect at the x-axis. But what do I know about f3? F3 would be 0 because I want to find that value of x3 where f3 is equal to 0. So I take this and make that equal to 0. Okay, so the first step I did was write from the similarity of triangles the equation which says x2 minus x1 over f2 minus x1 equals x3 minus x1 over f3 minus f1. Then that is the equation that I'm going to solve. I'm going to solve for x3 when f3 is equal to 0. Now you rearrange that equation, separate and rearrange that equation, you'll get the equation that I have written here. Okay. All you need to do is keep x3 on one side, on the left hand side, move everything else to the other side. And you will notice that here um, you will multiply this by f1 minus f1, okay, this minus f1. So you will take it across and then take x1 to the other side. So it is x1 minus f1 times x2 minus x1 over f2 minus f1. Do you see this? You can manipulate this, right? This again could be part of an exam question, okay? Derive the regular false method. What is the idea behind the regular false method? How do you develop that algorithm, okay? Any questions on that? Okay. So here is the equation and I showed you how to rearrange that, okay? So <clears throat> how would the function look like? Let me just start MATLAB. And the question now is, does one method work better than the other? Okay. Our goal in improving successively these ideas is to make sure that I can get a method in the end that works very well. 
what is the definition of works very well? Converges very fast. That's the job in few guesses, few iterations. Okay? Why would we want an efficient algorithm? You can ask that question, what does it matter? I don't care. The computer is doing the calculation. I will always live with the bisection method. Okay? The problem with the bisection method is it doesn't generalize to multiple equations and multiple unknowns. And often in simulators like process, uh, in a HISIS or HISEM, you will have to solve this nonlinear equation, a set of nonlinear equations, millions of times, not just once or twice. Okay? So you want an efficient method. And that's why a lot of effort has gone into improving successively these methods. Okay, so we're going to switch between the code and the MATLAB session. If I'm going slow, please do tell me. I can speed up because I... I, I so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take the... Okay, let me just copy it global zk. Remember, I'm, I'm setting up a global variable. I need to set up the same global variable in the function that I'm writing. Maybe I should show you the function. The problem we are going to use as a test is this flash, multi-component flash equation. Okay, And I'm using this because I'm going to show the same thing in Aspen when I introduce Aspen or ISIS. So this is the function. We have seen the model. And the function is basically a one-line function. And uh, that is given by the equation that I showed you earlier. Okay, so this is the function we are going to try to solve as an example. This function has k values and z values. k values are the equilibrium ratios between the liquid and vapor for a hydrocarbon, methane, ethane, propane, etc. Z are the feed compositions. So we take this feed, flash it into a drum, it produces products. And psi in this particular case is the fraction of vapor that goes into the vapor phase from the feed. Okay, so it should lie between 0 and 1. Once I know psi from the first equation, I can put that into the second equation to calculate what are the compositions in the liquid phase. And once I know that, you can use that in the additional equation to calculate the composition in the vapor phase. So the entire operation is known. For a given temperature and pressure, the K values are given. So you choose as a process engineer what temperature and pressure you want to flash that particular feed. Once you do that, then you go into some models that will give you the K values. Once the K values are given, you solve this equation, you get the vapor fraction at that temperature and pressure, and then you get the compositions. Okay? So it is this equation that I want to solve. That means I need to input the values for K and Z as an input. Okay? So the feed, uh, the equilibrium ratios, and the feed compositions. In this particular example, we are given and we're going to use this example to solve by various methods to see whether there is any improvement at all or not. Okay, so the feed composition is given as 0.25. It's an equimolar mixture of four components, methane, ethane, propane, and n-butane. Okay, and these are the K values uh, that I need to enter. Okay, so I say uh, Z is equal to 0 0.25, 0 0.25. What mistake did I make? That's a good opportunity. How, what did it interpret as? When I put a semicolon, what happens? It says that is the end of that line, right? And it doesn't make sense because it doesn't have a closing right brackets. That's why it gives an error. Okay. Okay. And the K values were 2, 1.51, 2, 1.51. Two, 1.51 and 0.1, 0.1, 0.1, oops. Okay, so I've set these up in my workspace. I've declared them as global. So when I execute the flash function, it'll pick up these values, okay? And um, did I have a wrong value? 0.5 and 0.1. So how can I fix that? Very good. You're getting better in MATLAB. All right. So the 
bisect we already did that but i'm going to execute it one more time to see whether bisect does better than regular false size scheme okay the idea that we have seen just now is called the regular false size scheme which puts a linear line okay so we'll execute both of them uh, bisect flash comma uh, what was it the guess which is between 0 and 1. I need to provide two guesses. The psi value is going to lie between 0 and 1. And then the tolerance, I give it as 1 e minus 7, for example. And then the trace, which says print every iteration. Okay. And we saw the structure of the bisect method last time. So it took about 20 iterations. The fraction of feed is only 4%, 4.34% of the feed goes to the vapor. And you can see these are the function values. So about six decimal places, the functions are close to enough to 0. Yeah. That one value, if, if I don't put the one value, for example, if I just terminate there, it gives me the answer. It doesn't give me. A, uh, it just, the one simply says, as you are making guesses, print me the guess values and the function values. Okay, so I, I call it as a trace, which traces the calculations if it is one. Okay, if it is not one, if you don't bother to give it, then it doesn't bother to print out the better guesses. Okay. Yeah. One times ten to the minus seven is the tolerance, which tells you how accurate you want. For example, if I change this to one minus ten to the minus two, that's a very. I'm I'm, I'm asking only for point zero one accuracy, two decimal places, and the answer is point zero three one three which is a wrong answer. So you want more accurate answer? Um, let, me, let me show you this with one. This is, these are good questions. So if I reduce the tolerance and I say print it out, it prints out every iteration. Now I see what is the function value the last time it made the guess. It is 0 0.01. The function value is not very close to zero. Okay. So it has terminated prematurely because I've said this accuracy enough for me. Okay. Typically, you should ask an accurate answer up to, at least up to 10 to the minus 4. Of course, if you want more accurate answer, what does it do? It takes more guesses to get to that. This is why the convergence tolerance is what you are specifying as 10 to the minus 4. If I say 10 to the minus 12, it takes 30, 37 iterations. But you don't see the difference because it is... 0 0.0435, 0 0.0434, right? Uh, what, what would happen if I say 10 to the minus 21, or 121? <laughs> Let me just put uh, 21. It'll take more iterations, like 53 iterations, right? So that is the idea of a tolerance, controlling the tolerance. Every MATLAB function, in fact, every, fun every simulator will have that option for you to control the accuracy of your simulation. Even in Aspen and Hisis, you will have that. But these are all preset with default values. So you don't have to worry about additional details like this. And they are set to 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, etc. But even in Aspen and Hisis, you will get situations where it doesn't converge. So when it prints out a message, Aspen prints out a message, it doesn't converge, you need to understand what it is. When it says it doesn't converge, maybe it tried several times and failed. Okay, And then how do you fix it? What can you do to fix it? These are the issues that this course will help you understand. Any other question? So you understand all the parameters there. The first one is the name of the problem that we are solving, the function that we have written. We have done that many times. The next one is the guess for your initial var variable that you are solving for. Now, some, many of these methods require two guesses, but some of them require only one guess. Okay? And the next one is the tolerance, how accurate you want the result. The last one is just a cosmetic one to print out every iteration what the trial that it is making. Okay? So that is bisect. Okay? Now, if I want to change this to the other scheme, I call that same scheme as REGFAL. Okay? I'll, maybe I'll show you how that function looks like. Okay, this is the function that implements a regular for say scheme. Okay, and let, let me open up bisect also. Okay, 
here is the function that we wrote in the last class for the bisection scheme. Okay? And we went through this function very in detail, and the main part of this function is this line, line 22. Update the guess, x3 equals x1 plus x2 over 2. For regular fault size scheme, the only change that you would need to make would be that line. Okay, Everything else would be the same. We replace that line by x3 equals the new formula that we have developed today from that straight line equation. Okay, That's the only thing that you need to check. Everything else idea is basically the same. We're solving the same problem, except we improve the, we hope we improve the uh, method. Okay. Let's see whether we have really improved the method. Particularly notice, uh, when I had the tolerance of 10 to the minus 12, it took 53 iterations by the uh, bisection method. It actually po fared poorly. It tried 100 iterations and it gave up maximum, exceeded maximum number of iterations. When did that occur? If you look at the function, we built a safeguard for that. If the number of iterations is more than 100, we said it is 100, and when it comes out of it, without meeting this tolerance criteria, then it prints out that error message. So a well-written function should have all these uh, things that will catch. If it fails for some reason, it should give you some meaningful answer, uh, the response and say, warn you about it. Okay? But if I do it for 10 to the minus 6, it gives me the result. Okay? Now, if I do this to 10 to the minus 6 with bisect, bisect does better still. Okay? But this is not really, they're all of the same order of magnitude. 16 iterations was 18 or 20 or 22. You will, uh, today, at the end of today's lecture, hopefully we will develop a method called the Newton method, which is the most powerful method there is. And you will see that it converges quadratically. And you will have to understand what does it mean when we say it converges quadratically. If the error is 10 to the minus 3, the error in here is the, this column, for example. If it is 10 to the minus 3, one more iteration doesn't, in this case, it doesn't increase it. For example, 0 0.007 to 0 0.001. The next time, actually, it goes up to 0 0.002. And then it comes to 0 0.0028. So it's kind of trial and error, it oscillates. And we say that this converges linearly. Okay? But a quadratic convergence would mean every time the error uh, becomes the power of the previous one. 10 to the minus 3 becomes 10 to the minus 6. Next iteration becomes 10 to the minus 12. So Newton method, when it converges, will converge in two or three iterations to very high accuracy, whereas these classes of methods don't. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Uh, the other thing I think I asked you to kind of explore is what would happen if K1 were different instead of 2 if it were 5? What do you think would happen? Now you're asking a question as a chemical engineer. What is the meaning of K value? It's a separation constant. So Ki is defined as Yi divided by Xi. So if Ki is large, what does it mean? Yi is large, bigger, right? That means there is more in the vapor phase than in the liquid phase, okay? So if I increase K, well, for one of them, for example, more of that component will go to the top, okay? Now, in this course, I'm introducing you because that provides us the motivation. Okay? Otherwise, we the course becomes dry. Where am I going to use this bisection method or second method? Okay? But I'm not going to really test you in that kind of a questions in an exam. Okay? Uh, but you will find these concepts useful when you do a unit operations course or a fluid mechanics course or a heat transfer course. The K value represents the ratio of the vapor to the liquid. So if a K value is large, more should go to the top. With that understanding, what would you predict would happen to this value of psi. Psi is the fraction of heat that is in the vapor. Okay, so if I say K1, oops, thank you. K1 equals five. I've increased one of the K values. Okay, what do you think would happen to psi? Will it go up or down? It should go up, right? And we can test that. 0.3845. Okay. And of course, both the methods should give you the same, whether it is bisect or sick regular false psi. They should give you the same result, but the number of iterations they take would differ. 
So in this course, we should develop an idea, appreciation for why is one method faster than the other. Okay. So this class of methods that we are seeing right now are all based on some sort of a linearization of the function. So they have a, we call them as a linear method, it converges linearly with every iteration. Any questions? We'll pursue this then. Okay. The second method. The next method is the second method. The third method we are seeing. So you should be able to explain the differences between this bisection, regular false side, and second method. The second method, the idea is exactly the same as in regular false side scheme. You make two guesses, you calculate the two functions, you put a straight line through them, and you ask the question, where does the straight line intersect? So the equation remains exactly the same. Okay. So what is the difference in the? Uh, I guess I forgot to tell you in the. Um, regular false side method, after we find x3, remember the idea that we used in the bisection method is we keep two values, discard one value, and we keep those two values that still have a bracketed root. So in this figure, going back to this figure, which of the root, two roots, x1 or x2, will, will you keep? Three we are going to always keep. Three is a new value that we have calculated using this new formula. So x3 is going to be the current value. x1 and x2 are two old guesses. I need to discard one of them. Keep the other one. Okay, So that I can repeat the process. Discard x2. How many of you agree with that? Why would you discard x2? It's a good, good thought process I want to develop further. Okay. Right. See, that's, I want everybody to go through the thought process, not just passively listen and absorb. Even if you're making a wrong guess, you make the wrong guess, and then go through the thought process, you will soon find out, oh, that's not right. Because what if, if I keep um, x1 and x3 and discard x2, then I need to ask, is f1 times f3 negative? Do I have a root between these? I don't. Where is the real root lie? The real root lies here. So I need to discard x1 and keep x2 and x3. That would mean I need to take x3 and place it in x1. So make this as a new x1. Okay. So x3 will go into x1. I will store it in x1. And I will store f3 into f1. And then I will look back. So in fact, that part of the algorithm didn't change at all. Okay, so when I showed you the two functions, the bisect and regular false side, okay, here is the bisect. All I did is change line number 22, and here is the regular false side. Watch this. I'm going to flip between these two. And the only line that you will see change is that line, right? So the logic of keeping which one that we need remained the same in the regular false side scheme as in the bisection scheme. But in the second method, you might actually ask, why would anyone want to do that? Okay, um, In the second method, you keep the last two values. You don't check. You don't check whether the root is being bracketed or not. Okay, So in this case, you will just keep f2 and f3. Even though there is no root between them, the root actually lies somewhere here. Okay, But you don't check. Otherwise, the updating scheme is the same. Okay, But the verifying scheme is different. Okay. And when you do that, you find accidentally, I guess, that whoever discovered the scheme, that you converge much faster than the previous schemes. But it is not guaranteed to converge. It might actually blow up. If you have poor guesses, it might blow up. Okay. So do you understand the idea? In the second method, the difference is you don't check to bracket the roots. You don't keep your x1 and x2 such that it lies on either side. We just keep the last two values. Let me show you how does the second method look, the function. Okay, in second method, this algorithm is the same as in the um, regular false size scheme. But I take x2 and put it into x1, and I take x3 and put it into x2. So I keep the last two values. So this line is different. Okay, I don't check 
previously I had a place where I was checking. Okay, where was that? I had this check. If the product of F1 times F3 is negative, then take X3, put it into X2, take F3 and put it into uh, X3, uh, else take X3 and put it into X1. So that is the check I did. That remained the same both regular falsi and bisection. But in the second method, you don't check. I took the if statement. You take always X2 and put it into X1 and X3 and put it into X2. So in, a, in, a, in an exam, I might give you all these three pieces of code and say, identify which one uses what algorithm. Okay? You should understand what is happening with each one of those algorithms. Okay? So any questions? The key is don't check. Now let me try to run this under the same condition. Otherwise, everything else is the same, right? Do you see the difference? What difference do you see? It took four iterations. Previously, it took 28 iterations under the same identical conditions, initial guess. The regular falsi and uh, the bisection takes up the order of 20 to 30 iterations. Second method just converges in four iterations. Okay. So it is a much more efficient method. And then, of course, mathematicians have come and analyzed and proven why it converges fast and shown that converges somewhere between 1 and 2, the rate of convergence is not quadratic, not linear, they would call it a super linear, it converges faster than the linear rate. Okay, So it's one of the efficient methods. Now what would happen if I have a function that does this? It has a maximum and I pick unfortunately my x1 and x2 to be such that x1 happens to be here and x2 happens to be there. What would happen to the method? So I pick two guesses, right, and I connect them, and I ask the question, where does the straight line intersect? <laughs> but if those two guesses happen to be on the same line, that line I'm going to draw now becomes almost horizontal. Where does it intersect the x-axis? Never, right? But we are not checking to make sure that they are on the opposite sides. So during your iteration, it might happen that these two guesses that you have lie approximately on the same level of the function values. Then that line doesn't intersect or it intersects at infinity. Okay? And then the method fails. So the second method is not guaranteed to converge. When it converges, it does really very fast, but it is not guaranteed to converge when you have the situation. Do you understand geometrically what's happening? Algorithmically, what happens if these two functions, for example, this is your x1 prime and x2, two guesses, two new guesses, and this corresponds to your f1 and f2, okay, and that is your new line. So this is f1, that is f2, and this is x2, and this is x1. I put it in blue color, okay. So when I take these numbers and put it into this equation, you notice why this happens. What is f2 minus f1 in that case? zero. So if these functions are very close to each other, that means f2 minus 1, the difference is very small. So you're dividing this number by a very small number. And so th this becomes very large. That is the place x3 where this blue line intersects the horizontal line becomes very far to the left or to the right. And that is what we call divergence. So the continuous sequence of calculations that you make will diverge, will blow up. Okay. And that's a concept that you need to understand. Sometimes the method do doesn't work. And you need to know why it doesn't work and what you can do to fix it. Normally, the thing that you can do is, if you're stuck with using second method, make different guesses and see whether it works or not. Or <coughs> switch to a different method. So all these ideas have been incorporated into FSOL. That's what makes FSOL a very powerful scheme. FSOL works under most situations. Okay. Any questions? So these concepts of what is convergence, what is convergence rate, what is divergence, uh, you should be able to explain in a few words in a short question in an exam. Okay? So this is the second method which I already showed you. <clears throat> Keep the last two values and that is the only difference. Okay? Otherwise the algorithm, the functions are all the same. They're all in the textbook. 
Okay, the next method we are going to see is, as I said, the most powerful method. It's called the Newton method by Newton. Okay, here the idea is the same. You are going to approximate the function by a straight line, but by not taking two guesses and connecting them by a straight line, but you, it, this requires only one guess. Okay, but it draws a tangent to the curve at that point. Okay, and that makes it quadratically convergent, and we will see that later on. Okay. Here is the Newton method, graphical illustration of the Newton method. Okay, so this is your curve, some arbitrary curve. This is your f of x, and we want to find this value where the f of x is equal to zero. Okay, you provide only one guess, and that guess is x1, and you calculate f1. But you not only calculate f1, you calculate f1 prime. f1 prime is df dx calculated at x1, the guess that you give. So you make a guess, at that guess you calculate what the function is, that's very simple to do, just plug the value of x, you get the value of function, but you need to calculate the derivative of the function, how fast the function changes, okay, and that becomes your new line. So what we are doing essentially is drawing a tangent to the curve and say, I really don't know where that curve is going, but I want to find out where the curve intersects the x-axis. So I'm asking the question, if I take this line to be the approximation, this introduces the idea of functional approximation, which we are going to use later on in many situations. How do I approximate a given function? Okay. So this tangent to the function is a good approximation, particularly when you're close to it. If you're somewhere close to it and you draw the tangent, that's going to be intersecting at the same place as the function is intersecting. So the idea is take that line and ask the question, where does that intersect? That becomes your new guess. And you calculate your new function, and you calculate your new slope at that point, and ask the question, where does that slope intersect the x-axis? Okay. So at every guess, you calculate the function, you calculate the tangent, and see where does the tangent intersect the x-axis. Is it clear, the idea? At times, it does become very dry because it's theoretical <laughs> subject, right? Algorithm development. As a chemical engineer, we are probably more excited when we are looking at applications and examples than development of these uh, algorithms and tools. But it is important to appreciate them because we use them routinely, okay? in, uh, whether you do Aspen, ISIS, and even more advanced computer simulations. So the formula for updating is now this. x2 equals x1 minus f1 over f1 prime, okay? So you need to be able to calculate the function, you need to be able to calculate the derivative of the function at x1. So you make a guess x1, and you calculate f1 and f1 prime, plug it into this formula, and that's your new guess. And repeat that loop, okay? And that will converge even faster. How do I develop that algorithm? I said this is your formula, this is your algorithm, this is your scheme for updating your initial guess. In Newton method, you need only one guess. How did I derive this particular equation? How do I know that this is the Newton method? <coughs> we are implementing this concept that I'm taking the tangent and I'm asking where that does the tangent intersect. Okay? So the tangent is the slope to the function. So the slope is calculated using two points. And those two points are, this is 0 minus f1. <coughs> okay, f1 is actually here. Okay, 0 minus f1 gives me this vertical distance divided by x2 minus x1. This is x2, this is x1. That gives me the horizontal distance. So it is nothing but calculating the slope using those two data points and equating it to f prime. But in this case, we know f prime analytically. We know how to calculate f prime. Okay, and when I show the example, you will see it. So all I need to do is extract x2 to the left hand side and push everything else to the other side. And that becomes my Newton method for a single variable in a single unknown. Any questions on that? Absolute silence. What does it mean? <laughs> you see, when I have some questions, I feel that at least I'm getting to you. If you have, if you're completely silent, I don't know whether I've lost you or you have understood completely. Is it clear? Kind of? 
How many of you are totally lost? Put up your hand. <laughs> totally lost. Okay. <laughs> should we just leave it like that? If everybody is in the situation, then we should not leave it like that. Okay. It is possible that sometimes you don't pay attention, you doze off, and that's where recording may have come handy to go back and see. Okay. So any questions? No questions? What we are seeing is progressive improvement in ideas on how to solve a single nonlinear algebraic equation. We have almost reached the conclusion of development of algorithms. We are going to see a little bit about the why some methods converge faster than the other. Okay, Some of the more con important concepts. The other thing that I will present to you now, but we will derive it using uh, a better Taylor series method is if I want to generalize this to two equations in two unknowns or three equations in three unknowns, which I've solved best, I all I need to do is replace everything by a vector instead of x as a single variable, x as a vector. So x2 is equal to x1 minus the derivatives that appear in the denominator will become a matrix because we have three functions in three variables you will have a 3 by 3 matrix, and that's called a Jacobian matrix. So this becomes J inverse F. <coughs> that is a Newton method. Very easily generalizes. Yeah. Does that say X1 minus J? Yeah, X1 minus J inverse F. And you can map term by term. Okay. This term is the new guess you're calculating. This term is your original guess, but it's a vector. Okay. And... Uh, this one becomes your Jacobian, inverse. Inverse, in matrix language, inverse is like division. Okay, And uh, the numerator is your function f. That's a vector. Okay, So this method, and we will show why this method is the right one. It's a generalized Newton method for multivariable system. Many equations in as many unknowns. So, any other questions? Yeah. Pardon me? What is the Jacobian matrix? Okay. So you saw that this is essentially the derivative of the function. Okay. Now, if I have two functions, okay, so f1 as a function of x1 and x2 equal to 0, and f2 as a function of x1 and x2 equal to 0. So I'm solving two equations in two unknowns. Okay. So obviously, what derivative do I calculate? If I have only one function in one equation, df dx is very easy to calculate. Okay, But when I have two equations and two unknowns, I might have a derivative of df1 with respect to dx1. What does the derivative contain as an information? It contains information about how fast that function changes with when x1 changes. It's a slope. Right? So in this case, I'm, if I change only x1 and keep x2 constant, that's what this partial derivative means. It tells me how fast the function f1 changes in the x1 direction. Similarly, I can calculate this df1 with respect to dx2. That will answer the question or contain the information how fast the function f1 changes in the x2 direction. Okay? And similarly, I can calculate df2 with respect to dx1 and df2 with respect to dx2. And this collection of derivatives is what is called j, Jacobian. Okay, so remember the, the analogy that I gave you a couple of lectures ago, when you have two equations and two unknowns, it's like a mountain, okay? The two functions would be like two mountains, and x1, x2 will be your longitude and latitude. So if you go only north and asking what is the elevation change, that will be like calculating df1, dx1 on the first mountain, okay? And if you go in the south, east-west instead of north-south, you are on the same mountain, you are asking how much the elevation changes in the x2 direction. And the same idea applies for f2 and x2. And in solving the two equations into unknowns, we want to find out where these mountains intersect. That's your valley, and that's where the river is. And that curve, where does it intersect the sea um, surface? That's where the function is equal to 0. So we are trying to solve for x1 and x2 <coughs> by searching in those directions. And that's why you need these partial derivatives. And those partial derivatives are the ones that go in there. Okay? Does that give you some idea of what the Jacobian is? We will see an example. In the next assignment, I will put an example in the multivariate case where you will solve 
um, these using um, F-Solve, which is easy to do, and then using Newton method as well. <coughs> so how does the Newton algorithm look? There it is. Okay. What is the difference between bisection, secant, regular foci, the three methods that we have seen? We need to have an extra function. This function is your original function that we have already written. So again, you'll go back to the flash problem. But in addition to that, I need to write another function to solve this problem, and that is the Jacobian, that is the partial derivatives of all the functions with respect to all the variables. Of course, the next guess, the x is the guess, and you need only one guess. Okay, and then the tolerance, and then the trace. These are optional items. So the algorithm is structured exactly the same way as the other methods, except I need to write an additional function called JAC. It's a Jacobian matrix for multivariate case, <coughs> and X is the initial guess. So I'm going to ask you a few questions because you're being passive. Okay, what does this line do? What could it do? Yes. Maximum number of iterations. Okay, I'm setting up the Newton method. I know it doesn't require hundreds of iterations. I say, okay, try 25 iterations. Okay. And n equals length of x. It finds out how big the problem is. How many equations do I have? Because x is a vector. Remember, the Newton method is applicable for multidimensional systems. Of course, it will work for one dimensional system too. Okay, so the length of vector is not the guesses, but it is a number of equations. If I put three numbers there, immediately it says, okay, you have three equations and three unknowns. So you should be able to give me ability to calculate the three function values. F should also be of length three. Okay, <clears throat> and count just sets up a counter. Okay, I've done iteration one, iteration two, iteration three, and it will compare against max. Okay. Now here I have changed just to illustrate the for loop versus the while loop. So previously we had for i equals 1 to 100. Here I'm saying while the norm of f is greater than tolerance and count less than max. Just if reading English except the syntax you need to stick to it. Okay. What does it mean? As I just read out, it means the norm of f. What does the norm function do? Do you know what a norm is? In algebra, I must have seen a norm of a vector. Norm is the length of a vector. Okay, how large a vector is. <coughs> so the norm function calculates the length of that particular vector, and it simply does it by <coughs> norm of f is calculated as f1 square plus f2 square plus f3 square, etc. square root of that. Okay. So that is one measure of the length of vector. There are many other measures of the length of vector. So if you actually type norm, anything that is done in MATLAB is the most general implementation of it. Okay. So L norm. And in linear algebra, you would have seen all these definitions of norm. <coughs> norm of a matrix or a vector. So if you pass only norm x, it calculates the default norm, that is the length, okay? And that is returns a two norm of x. That's what I gave you, square root of sum of squares, okay? <coughs> but there is also called infinity norm, or the maximum values. So there are many definitions of norm in linear algebra and in functional analysis, okay? And MATLAB implements all those definitions. By default, the most often used one is the quadratic norm, okay, the sum of uh, square root of sum of squares. But here, for example, the p norm, which will simply say is f1 to the power p plus f2 to the power p plus f3 to the power p, p root of that, okay. So that's a generalization. <coughs> but for our purposes, all we need is the quadratic norm. So if that norm is greater than tolerance, that is the length of that vector f is larger than the tolerance, which is uh, typically set as 10 to the minus 2. That basically means that the function values are very large compared to the tolerance. And at the same time, the count, count is the number of counters, how many times I've done the iteration, is less than the maximum. Keep doing this, whatever is in the loop. What is in the loop? 
first calculate the function, f eval, transfers control to the function, and that function is one that you write. So it, it takes the value of x and returns the value of f. Then you also make a call to JAC, the Jacobian, using f eval. That's another function that we must write, okay? We write that and we pass the control and we get the Jacobian. And this is the Newton algorithm, which says x is equal to x minus j inverse f. The j inverse f operator is this. Okay, j is a matrix in general and f is a vector, okay? <coughs> Let me ask you another question here. I said x equals x minus j f. Is that legitimate? What am I trying to do there? The formula that I wrote, if you remember, was something like x2 is equal to x1 minus f1 divided by f1 prime, or as a vector, x2 equals x1 minus j inverse f at 1. So I had, when I written the formula, I uh, denoted x2 and x1 to be two different ones. x1 is your initial guess, x2 is your next guess. But in the formula, I replaced it as x equals x minus j f. Is that right? If I didn't have that, what would I have to, how would I have to change? Okay, let's just say if I want to implement whatever is in this line, how would I have replaced that line? I would have replaced it by, maybe let me just open that function, you will see it better. Newton, where is Newton? There. What I should have done is, I should have done x2 equals x1, okay? That would implement that particular line. It says take x1 as your guess, and of course I have to fix everything as x1 here. For example, I should call this as x1, right? Then the correct value of x1 will come, and it will go here at x1, and then I would have x2 equal to x1. So that's my first iteration. Then what would I have to do next? I would have to take that x2 and put it into put it into x1 exactly. So I would say x1 is equal to x2. So take the new guess and make it the old one, and then put the loop around that, and the loop would work. Right? But that is the same if I use just one variable. Okay? And um, that's why I could simply take the x and replace it into the same vector because then it becomes the new guess. You understand the idea? I completely lost many of you now, I think, <laughs> when it comes to programming. Any questions? The way I have changed it would work. Do you agree with that or not? Do you understand what I'm trying to do? I'm pro providing an initial guess x1 that is done here. And then I take that value of x1. Of course, I, in order to make this completely work, I need to, wherever I had x, I need to put x1. Okay, and then I'm passing those values of x1 here and getting my new value of function name. And so I'm passing the same value of x1 here and I'm getting the Jacobian, the matrix. And then I say x2 equals x1 minus j inverse f. Yeah. Good question, good question. Why do I have f equal to 1? The reason is, the question is on line 16. Why did I have f equal to 1? The reason is, when I come for the very first time to execute line 17, I'm going to calculate the norm of f, but it is not defined. Okay, so I put a value of 1 to make sure that it is large. If I put 0, what would happen? Can I do, for example, f1 equal to 0? Then the norm would be 0, and it would say I've converged and it will quit. Okay, so you have to put a value that is fairly large, 1, 2, or 100, whatever it is. Okay? And so that is just to handle the first time case. Okay? And in this line, line 20, now I'm calculating x2. Yeah? Do you have to change up at the top um, the function x equals x minus j? Yeah. Like, you can't just change up x1. Where do I have that? There's the variable where you have x equals j. Does that have to stay there? Ah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I must change it to either x1 or x2. Correct. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm implementing the algorithm the way that I have developed, which is x2 equals x1 minus j inverse f, and then I say now x2 is my new guess, 
So I put it into X1 and then I increment the counter to see how many times I've gone through the loop. And if the trace is set, then I print <coughs> and then uh, I, I quit, okay, when it is converged. So any questions on the algorithm? One thing that you should do, I think you guys are doing very well in MATLAB so far, and please with that, uh, but take a look at these functions if you want to continually improve this and understand and make these changes, okay, and understand the implications of that, okay? So how do I, let me save this. I, again, I made some changes. I hope it works. <laughs> and I need to show you the function, which is the flash function. Okay, that remains exactly the same as before. This flash function is the problem I'm solving. I've used it with bisect, secant, regular, falsi, and it works. Okay, but in order to use it with Newton method, this alone is not sufficient. I need to write another function, which would be the derivative of the function. Excellent, right? So how do I calculate the derivative? Okay, the function is, <coughs> you see the function here. I want the derivative of this function with respect to psi. The psi is my unknown. So how do I calculate df d psi? Can you help me? You have the summation sign. How many of you, if I give you a piece of paper and say you get five points if I get this right, be able to take the derivative of the function with respect to psi? You should be able to, the calculus, right? So at least one hand went up, so I should give him five right <laughs> anyway. In case you have the confidence to say yes. How would I take the derivative of this? Okay. It is of the form d of u over v. Derivative of function which is u over v, right? Do you remember this? These days you don't have to remember it. You just search in the Google and it gives you the formula. If you go to Wolfram Alpha, it actually takes the derivative of the function for you. Okay. So it's going to be v square v du minus u dv. That is the formula, the chain rule type of formula. Okay. So I need to apply that. So I need to have the denominator entire thing squared. So ki minus one psi plus one squared. And then in the numerator, <coughs> v times the derivative of this numerator. But then what is the derivative of the numerator? With respect to psi. Remember, k and z are constants. Right? I'm taking with respect to psi. So it is 0 minus u dv. Okay? That is the de denominator multiplied by the, sorry, the numerator multiplied by the derivative of the denominator. So it's going to be ki minus 1 z i. Sorry, minus 1. Multiplied by the derivative of the denominator with respect to psi. What would that be? Ki minus 1. Right? That is the derivative. So I need to write a function which will take a guess for psi and at that guess value it will calculate this function which is the slope, slope of the function. Okay. And any questions on that? Remember I have k i minus 1 square in the numerator. Okay. So I call that function d flash, the derivative of the flash. Basically make a copy of that and replace this line. This is what I want you to do. Go through the such codes and see whether you understand how that code is implementing the particular equation that we have. You can begin to see ki minus one dot square dot z. I'm using a dot product here because I have a vector. Remember, z is a vector and k is a vector. Okay, and then the sum is a function, which is the summation sign that I already have in the formula. So the summation sign is there. There is a minus sign there. And then in the numerator, ki minus 1 square, the denominator, ki minus 1 times psi plus 1 square. Okay. <clears throat> Any question on that function? So the way that I'm going to use this in MATLAB is name of the function Newton, flash, which is the name of the function I'm trying to solve, what would be next? D flash, very good, that's good. D flash, come on. I need to provide a guess. I'm just providing 0.3, for example. And then the tolerance, 1d to the power minus 9. And then the trace, which says print me at every iteration. So the D flash, 
de flashes the Jacobi. I'm really glad. Even if you say that, I know that I'm getting to you. So give me that feedback. I need that. Okay. D flash is the Jacobian. In this case, it's a Jacobian one, one by one matrix because there's only one function on one variable. If you go two functions, two variables, the D flash will return a two by two matrix. Okay. So this Newton method worked very fast and it gave you the same result as 0.3845 as the previous ones. But I want to illustrate this point that I asked for only 10 to the minus 9. Right? Look at the convergence. When I say it's quadratically convergent, remember these are what I call residual or the function values at every guess. Okay? So the first time the function was 0.107 e to the minus 1. The next time it becomes e to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 3, then 10 to the minus 6, then 10 to the minus 12. This is what we mean by quadratic convergence. Every time the previous error is quadratically multiplied raised to the power 2. Okay, 10 to the minus 3 to the power 2 is 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus 6 power 2 is 10 to the minus 12. Okay, so it gives you 12 digits accuracy in four iterations. You have to do extra work, and that extra work is the derivative. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Um, where did the negative come from in this derivation? Okay, and you understand why it comes there, right? And where is it in the function? All right. There. Okay. I should separate them out. You can see that, right? Yeah. <coughs> now, one of the common mistakes people make in cal calculating the derivatives, and I have made as a student many, many times, so I am alerting you to that, is remember, if f of x is equal to 0, if I simply change this as minus f of x, the root doesn't change. The function may look different. For example, if the function looks, f of x looks like this, the root is there, and the function may look like this, but the root will exactly be the same. All I'm doing is flipping the sign. Okay? But so, sometimes, in the, particularly in this example, I might give you this equation as ki minus 1 or 1 minus ki. I'm flipping the sign, but it doesn't change the root. Okay. But when I'm calculating the derivative, I should make sure that I use the correct form that I use here. I use k minus 1, use k minus 1, and take the derivative. I use 1 minus k, use 1 minus k. Okay. Because the slope is not the same. The slope would be opposite of that. And that will not give you the right answer. So little method will fail to converge. Okay. Now, suppose I give it a poor guess. Let's see what happens. Two. It blows up. So when Newton method converges, it converges quadratically. But if you don't give it a good guess, it can blow up. Why would it blow up? <coughs> One is still a good guess. It took a few more iterations. But it preserved that quadratic convergence. 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 14. Right? <coughs> <coughs> so why does Newton method fail? The Newton method fails if you have a function that has a behavior like a maxima or a minima. Okay. So if the function is has something like this, and you give it an initial guess somewhere here, it needs to go from there to there. So somewhere along the way, it hits the guess something like this. You have the same problem as you had in second method. Okay? So the tangent becomes zero, the slope becomes zero, and you have a division by zero. That produces this not a number. So the, you should understand what this means, NAN. INF means infinity. NAN means not a number. So if it gets into an operation where you're dividing by zero, it produces that NAN symbol, which means that you're having some problem in convergence. <clears throat> Am I going fast? <clears throat> Command window. <coughs> so 
So after seeing all these methods, FSOL is a good tool because FSOL requires from you the minimum amount of information. You need to provide the function and you need to provide a guess. Okay. These methods we see sometimes we need to provide two guesses. Sometimes we need to provide a method for calculating the Jacobian, like in the Newton method. Now, FSOL is also powerful enough to take that information. If you have, if you can write a Jacobian function, it can use that information and convert you in faster. But it doesn't ask you for that. Okay. So if you read now the help on FSOL, you will understand that help message much better because we have a little bit of theoretical knowledge about how these algorithms work. So when they tell, talk about Jacobian, you know what Jacobian is. Okay. <clears throat> Did you have a question on the command window? No? Okay. Any other questions? All right. <clears throat> so we have seen very simple ideas, but a lot of ideas on how to successively improve the best method in this class being the Newton method. Now, a little bit more theory, okay? So what, in the course, what we have done is how to develop models, how to solve models using MATLAB without really understanding how MATLAB does. Now we are exploring how MATLAB does these things, how do we develop the algorithm? In a very heuristic way, we develop that. Now we are going to ask the question, why do these algorithms work? Okay, why does one method work better than the other? What do we mean by rate of convergence? Those issues. And those are done very nicely with using this idea called a fixed point iteration. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what is a fixed point iteration method. And it is a common method that we chemical engineers have been using a very long time. Okay, even before we did these computational tools came. That is what we used to call just trial and error. If you have a heat exchanger design or a distillation design, you just make a guess. You solve your equations, try to get a better guess, and repeat that process. Okay? And mathematicians have a very general framework for this called the fixed point iteration. What is the idea behind the fixed point iteration? The idea is the following. You are still given a problem, f of x equal to 0. You need to solve that equation by making a guess. Okay? But in the fixed point iteration framework, what you do is you rearrange that equation as x equal to g of x. Rearrange, and it is always possible to rearrange that equation. I'll give you a few examples that will illustrate the idea. Then you say, okay, this is where if I can separate and rearrange it in this form, this is my input or guess, whatever you want to call it, and I have a new function g which I can calculate, and what comes out of it is automatically the best guess. Okay, so this is the next best guess. So I put a superscript on n plus 1 and then n. So I write this equation as xn plus 1 equal g of xn. n equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. So you put a guess in this and get out a new value and repeat that process. <clears throat> that is the basic idea behind a fixed point iteration. But if you understand and track how does it actually work, you will understand when does it converge, when does it not converge, how can I say whether a particular method will converge. We can say things like when would secant method converge or when would uh, bisection method converge, Newton method converge. <coughs> okay, so make a guess for x0, plug it into the right hand side, and generate a new guess for x1 and repeat that process. Now here I use the index n, but it's the same, index n dot k. That gives you that counter if you like. <clears throat> when this process converges, what should happen? How do I know when the process converges? I put a guess and I get a new guess, right? In this scheme, I put a guess here, I get a new guess. So when would I know when something has converged? You get the same guess. You put a number and it returns the same number. You put the same number again, it returns the same number, right? That means it has converged. When the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, it has converged it's because there is no more room to improve. Okay, <clears throat> so at convergence, then R is the root. So R is the one that will go to the right hand side, and R will be the one that comes out. When you reach that stage, you know that you have converged. That sequence has converged. Let's take a few examples. Okay, the first example is a quadratic equation: x square minus x minus six equal to zero. 
we know that it has two roots by factorization. We have actually done this problem before. Okay, r equals minus two and r equals to three. So the first thing that we need to do is, given an equation like this, how can I write it as x equal to g of x? And this process is not unique. Not unique meaning, you can do it in many different ways. For example, I can take in this case, keep the x square on the left hand side and move everything else to the right hand side. So I can write this as x square equals x plus six. So x is equal to square root of x plus six. I would call this as my new g of x. So I've written it in the form, x equals g of x. <coughs> okay, now I make a guess for x equal to one, put it there, score square root of seven. Well, I found out whatever that is, that is my new x2, okay. <coughs> so here I'm illustrating initial, suppose the initial guess is five. What would happen? What would the 10 different values would be, okay. This code does that for i equals 1 to 10. I've written a new function called g of x, which takes x and gives you a new value. Okay, so the first guess is 5. So I put it into 5. 5 plus 1 is 6. Square root of 6 is 3.31. That's my second value. I take that value and put it into the right hand side. So 3.16 plus 1, 4.316. Take the square root of that. I get this one. 3.05. But what you see is this pattern converges. If I keep doing this 10 times, I put on the right hand side 3 and I get 3 on the left hand side. Of course, what is the right hand side? x plus 6. Right? When I put 3 here, it becomes 9. Square root of 9 is 3. So that is why I say r is equal to g of r at the root. If I put the root on the right hand side, I'm going to get the root exactly on the left hand side. <clears throat> Any questions on this calculation? This is called a fixed point iteration. The point is called the fixed point. So 3 is the fixed point or the root is the fixed point and the method will be attracted to that. The sequence of calculation will be attracted to that if it converges. If it diverges, it will be a repeller. It'll, even if you start very close to the root, it will just go away from the root. That's divergence. So we understand the convergence and the divergence and the rate of convergence, etc. Any questions on the method? Given an equation f of x equal to zero, you rewrite it as x equal to g of x, and then make an initial guess and generate the sequence of numbers. It's a very powerful method. It's a very simple method, but it's a very powerful method as we will learn later on. That if you can say a lot about convergence, you can do something called acceleration of convergence to speed up the convergence. But pictures are always worth thousand words. So how does this sequence look like pictorially? A graphical representation. <coughs> okay, so remember we have x equals square root of x plus 3 and this is my g of x and this is my left hand side. So the sequence of calculations that I showed is, I'm going to split this for example into two parts. The left hand side is equal to x. So I'm going to call this as y is equal to x on the left hand side. On the right hand side, I have y is equal to square root of x plus 3. That is my right hand side. When the left hand side and the right hand side are equal, I have found my solution. <coughs> so I can graph the left hand side alone. When I graph the left hand side alone, what do I get? I get this curve. y is equal to x, the 45 degree line, where y and x are exactly the same. That is that equation. Okay. <coughs> when I graph the right hand side, what is that equation? That equation is this green line, the, the square root of x plus 3. <coughs> okay. When the left hand side is equal to right hand side is the point of intersection of these two curves. That is my root r, where these two left hand side is equal to the right hand side, the intersection point. Okay. So I make an initial guess. In this case, I made an initial guess of 5. And I put it on the right hand side. Okay, This is an important graphical understanding. is very important. Pay attention to it, please. Because you will use this in later on in other courses where you're looking at distillation column design. How to solve two equations graphically by a trial and error method, for example. So here I start with the guess. And I put it on the right hand side. 
Okay, and that is equivalent to reading the number from the green curve. Because that is the equation for the right hand side. Right? So it is like reading the functional value for x equal to uh, 5 on this curve. Then I'm going to take that and put it back. Okay, that is means I'm going to go to the 45 degree line. <clears throat> okay, so the construction process is starting from here, see where it intersects the right hand side, go on to the left hand side curve. Then calculate the new value for the right hand side. That is reading the value from the green curve. Take that and put it onto the left hand side. That is going horizontally. Okay, and come down. And if you keep stepping like this, you will eventually go to the truth. Okay. So what, what do we need for this process to converge? They should be going towards in a stepwise fashion. Okay. And we will see one, one more example where this will not happen. And that will tell us why it converges in one case and why it doesn't converge in the other case. Any questions on this process? Yeah. Good question. What happened to the other route? Think about it. You see, this is the important process. If you ask a question, you can find out an answer. If I want to get the other route, what would you try to do? You would try to go for a different guess. That's the only way you have. This equation should give you both routes. They should be satisfied at both routes. Okay? So we're going to see that in the next example. I start with a different guess, and maybe I'll go to the other route. Okay, and we'll learn something about when, under what conditions, it will go to one or the other route. But it's good that you're reminded that there is another route to this problem. <clears throat> so another way of rearranging that equation is x equals <coughs> 6 divided by x minus 1. <coughs> How did I get that? Let me go to the original equation. Okay, x squared minus x minus x. Okay, so in, I can factor this as x times x minus 1 minus 6 equal to 0. Then I can say x, x minus 1 equal to 6, so x is equal to 6 divided by x minus 1, which is my new g of x. This is what I meant by saying there is no unique way of writing as x equals g of x. If you are given f of x equal to 0, there are many ways of rearranging it into the sequence. This is the second method. <clears throat> now the g of x is 6 divided by x minus 1. So if I start with the same initial guess for the second one, what do I get when I generate these sequence of numbers? <clears throat> okay, it, it does not really converge anywhere. Okay, it goes to the other root. If I continue the sequence, perhaps it will go to the other one. Graphically, how does this look? In order to do that, I need to plot again x equal to y that line, the 45 degree line, and I need to plot x equal to 6 divided by x minus 1. Okay, that is my g of x. Of course, when x equal to 1, what happens to that function? It blows up, right? So x equal to 1, it has a singularity. Infinity goes to infinity. Okay, so that's the same curve as both parts. Now I started with an initial guess uh, somewhere here, okay, and I went to this curve, alternate, and what I see is it diverges from there. It goes to the other side. If I continue that, you will find that it goes to the other root minus 2. I want you to pay attention to these two graphs before the next class, but I think uh, we are running out of time and maybe patience uh, to go through some intricate points. So I will start with this graph again in the next class. I want you to pay attention to these two because there's an important lesson conclusion that we're going to draw on when does it converge, when does it diverge. They are in the notes. They are in the notes. And I also uploaded these notes onto that. I mean, they're also in the textbook. Okay, and in the notes. Yeah. <clears throat>